rahmatullah wa barakatuh. The greatest right of God. The greatest right of God against you is that you worship him without associating anything with him. When you do that with sincerity, he has made it binding upon himself to give you sufficiency in the affairs of this world and the next. Respected viewers, welcome to the world of Imam al-Sajjad. Welcome to Risalat al-Haquq. But what is Risalat al-Haquq? Why has his masterpiece been neglected? When did Imam al-Sajjad write this? And what lessons and mysteries and wonders are found upon this great work? And what are the rights of God? Let us discuss and more with my guest, Sayyid Dr. Amar Nakshwani. Sayyid, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. Wa Alaikum as How are you Allah. this evening? Very well, thank you. Very well and honored at the same time to be discussing the wonderful uh, works of Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam. So, Imam Sajjad is known for many, many works, but this one in particular. Why we never um, discussed this or studied it in the mosques? Do you feel it's been a little neglected? Yes, I certainly feel that this work has been neglected in, in our mosques, um, in our centers. Uh, it's sad how many of the followers of Ahlul Bayt السلام, have never ever in their life read any of the hukuk in the risala, any of the duties or any of the responsibilities we have as human beings within this particular treatise. And on two levels, I think it's of the utmost importance. I think on the first level, it highlights how much of a community that has neglected literature and reading we have become. You know, sadly, we tend to rely on being spoon fed. If the lecturer doesn't speak about a topic, we're not going to take it upon ourselves to go and look for these pieces of work. And yet these pieces of work have all been translated now in numerous languages. If you speak Mashallah. Farsi, mm -hmm. it's in Farsi. If you speak Arabic, it's in Arabic. If you speak Urdu, it's in Urdu. If you speak English, it's in English. In fact, you've got uh, Qudratullah al-Mashayikh's analysis of Rasalat al huquq available in the English language with the translation of uh, Lisa Zainab Morgan. And I highly recommend Mashallah. people to try and get hold of it. It's available online. Okay. Then in the Arabic language, the likes of Sayyid Hassan al gubwanchi have written a fantastic analysis of Rasalat al huquq and of the many lessons that can be learned from Rasalat al huquq of the Imam. So I think on the first level, us as a community has to begin to reflect just how much of a relationship do we have with literature in general mm -hmm. and with the literature of the Ahlul Bayt in particular. Even sometimes in our mosques, when we enter our mosques, I think it's fundamental now, there has to be a bookshop as soon as you enter Asant. any mosque Asant. or indeed any of the Imam Bargas or any of the Husseiniyas that we have. It's a shame that you have mosques where you'll walk in, you'll see a big lecture hall, mm -hmm. but fundamentally you need to also have an area for literature for people to at least either buy books or to be able to borrow books from the library within that mosque. Asant. Secondly, one of the best works that anyone can give to a non-Muslim which gives you an understanding of the whole of the religion of Islam and the duties and the responsibilities of every Muslim is Risalat al huquq I'm not surprised that Sheikh al saduq in three of his you know, monumental works Khisal mm -hmm. um, al saduq Amal al saduq and the Faqih he mentions the duties and the obligations from Imam Zain al Abidin within the Risalat al Hukuq. He finds it fundamental that it's not just to be narrated in one of his works, but in three of his works. And I think it's fundamental. Why? Because every Muslim was given their duty, their responsibility. And I think this type of work can affect anyone. As in now, as a Muslim, what is my duty with my neighbors? What's my duty with non-Muslims? What's my duty and responsibility with my parents? With my siblings? Even with the one who calls us to Adhan in our mosque? Wow. Even he has a haq over us. Mashallah. So, if some of your non-Muslim friends today ask you, is there any book you could give me about the religion of Islam? Mm -hmm. 
or a book that gives you a general understanding of the religion, as in an understanding in which we're able to learn about the religion, the ethos of the religion, and so on, then I would say the best work for us to give is the Risalat al Hukuk. Now, someone might turn around and ask a question. Okay. That you Muslims follow the Holy Quran. Yes. Why wouldn't that be the best book for you to give to a non Muslim? The Holy Quran, no doubt, has affected, influenced, and inspired so many in history. But in this day and age, the Quran, the Bible, the Torah, there are certain wordings, mm -hmm. there are certain phrases, yes. which today may be viewed as offensive when you're living, especially in the Western diaspora. Someone might say, okay, how about Nahj al Balagha, for example? Mm -hmm. That has a compilation of the sermons, say, of Imam Amir al Mu'minin. Mm why wouldn't you give that to a non-Muslim? I certainly yes. think giving Nahj al Balagha to a non-Muslim is something good because there are many one-liners of Imam mm -hmm. Amir al Mu'minin, which are phenomenal. Indeed. But Nahj al Balagha, a person needs to have a profound historical knowledge and context of the Imam's biography. You know, if you give it to a non-Muslim and it says this was his sermon on the way back from Safin, they haven't no, got a clue what, what Safin, Safin is. is. Yes. This was after Hunayn, this was at Jamal, this was after Saqifah. You know, such words given to a non-Muslim within such a work is very difficult. Therefore, if the Quran and Nahj al Balagha in the year 2017 are not necessarily the works to give to a non-Muslim colleague of yours at work or a friend at mm. school or college, or university. So which work would you give? I personally would say that you give Risalat al-Hukuq. You give Risalat al-Hukuq. It's got and has provided for us an understanding of how we grow as human beings and in terms of our evolution, how we are able to build the society that surrounds us, purify ourselves, and ensure that our conscience is still alive. Sorry. Really the whole ethos of the religion of Islam is given within this work. And so when you ask me why some of our mosques have not looked at it, I believe mm -hmm. that we can ponder over this for a long time. Uh -huh. But the reality should be that all of us should begin Indeed. to have lessons or tafsir or sharh of Risalat al hukuq in our mosques for the youths and for the elders combined. Ascent. Yeah. Just a quick message to all the viewers is that as we will be going doing the discussion and if you have any questions that you would like to ask the Sayyid, please contact us on 0203 515 or alternatively you could WhatsApp us and inshallah the Sayyid will be answering your questions. Furthermore, in the following programs we will be discussing different parts of the treaty inshallah and I hope you'll be looking forward to that as much as I will be. Doctor, um, in regards to Imam Sajjad, I mean, if he wrote this, when did he write this? Why did he write this? Is Risalat al Hukuk within Sifa Sajjadiyah or are they two separate works? No, it's definitely separate from Sahifa Sajjadiyah. Imam really comes into the fore of Islamic history after Karbala. Yes. And I think Karbala not only logically affects him as a human being, but instead of the many who would have a post trauma. Mm -hmm stress affecting them in their lives, the Imam actually looks at Karbala and uses what happened to begin to rebuild the Muslim and the identity mm -hmm. and definition of what is a Muslim. Awesome. I think at Karbala, if we put Shia, Sunni, everything aside, it was the lowest point in the history of Islam and sadly had brought back the days of ignorance and seen them permeate into the Islamic faith. People had forgotten how to respect God. People had forgotten how to purify themselves. Their tongues were now full of obscenities. Their eyes wouldn't mind watching blood. Their stomachs wow. wouldn't mind consuming that which was forbidden. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't mind being rude to the one who agrees with them or disagrees with them. They've forgotten the very essence of worship and its meaning. Now, Imam Zayn al-Abidin after Karbala, sadly many times in our majalis, the only thing we ever hear about him is that this was a man who used to cry a lot. Indeed. So always within our majalis, I, you know, you'll hear speakers saying 
how emotional Imam Zain al Abidin was, how sad he was after Karbala. And these are within the narrations as well. That no one can deny that. Abu Hamza Thamali is one of his closest companions and Abu Hamza himself narrates mm -hmm. that I would see Imam Zain al-Abdin crying years after Karbala. But Abu Hamza Thamali also provides us with two other wonderful pieces from Imam Zain al-Abdin which highlight how the Imam did not just want people to cry from hearing what took place at Karbala mm -hmm. but wanted them to use the musibah of Karbala, yes. the tragedy of Karbala to be something transformative. Okay. Something that allows you to grow as a human being. Okay. Something that allows you to contemplate and reflect and become a better person. Mm -hmm. Abu Hamza Thamali, not only does he narrate the wonderful supplication that we recite in the yes. holy month of Ramadan, albeit quite long, yes. uh, but eventually we get there after like reciting it for like How seven and a half hours or something. <laughs> Dua Abu Hamza Thawali, which you know all the viewers will know well. Yes. But also, Abu Hamza Thawali is one of the narrators of Rasalat al Hukuk. It seems, according to some of the ulama, that it's as if the companions of the Imam ask him mm -hmm. to provide them an understanding of their duties as a Muslim. If today I, if you, Sayyid Muhsin, ask me, said Ammar, what's my duties as a Muslim? Who, who has got rights over me as a Muslim? What are my responsibilities as a Muslim? You'll find that the Imam replies back with, in some narrations, 51 mm -hmm. different rights and responsibilities that a complete Muslim has to have fulfilled. That's How nice. many? 51. 51. MashaAllah. Rights and responsibilities. That a complete Muslim, because today the word Muslim is branded everywhere. Indeed. Everyone's become a Muslim. Everyone's now become a mu'min. Yes. Everyone's become a qadi and a mufti and, and a mullah and a khalifa and so on. But how many of us have reflected what did Ahlul Bayt ask from us Hassan. in terms of our duties and our responsibilities as a Muslim? In reality, our duties and responsibilities as a human being. What's my responsibility as a human being? What's my duty? Mm -hmm. When I was a child, my world was purely a world of five senses. Touch, mm -hmm. taste, smell, hear, for example. Yes. And see. As I grew, I began to see that there was responsibilities that were now upon me. As an adolescent, I was wondering, how do I please God? But then how do I satisfy myself? Mm -hmm. Myself wants its desires fulfilled. Mm -hmm. My imagination is raging. But then I've got this faculty also called anger. It can be used positively, can be used mm -hmm. negatively. Yes. But then I've got my parents. Now I've got to balance my parents and my duties towards my parents with my duties towards my Lord. But then I've also got my siblings. But then I also live in a country called the UK, for example, Indeed. England, or I live in the United States of America, or I live in Canada. What's my duties there? Yes. But then I've also got duties when I'm in transactions. Mm -hmm. In the world of business, I've got ethics related to the world of business. But then I've also got duties related to my community. Yes. Now, all of these duties I hear about in different lectures. Mm -hmm. In the Rasalat al Hukuq, I've got all of them one next to the other. As a Muslim, I believe it could be seen as that black book which everybody needs to have, okay. which provides you an outline of what must be ticked before you get to that graveyard. Asant. And I think it's wonderful because the complete Muslim. Mm -hmm is the one who has read Rasalat al huquq reflected on whether they have observed their responsibilities with their creator, with their self, with their body, mm -hmm. with their fellow creations. Yeah. So when it comes to the Treaty of Rights, I mean, contemporary, modern day age, human rights is a big discussion and it's always on the news. People are always protesting and, you know, um, for, for human rights to make sure it is upheld. How does that relate to Rasa, uh, Rasat al-Hukuk? Does it contribute at all? 
Well, I'd be delighted if we have law students who are watching the show tonight, mm -hmm. or those of you who have friends who are studying law, especially human rights law. You know, there are many who have sought to provide us with declarations and conventions and bills related to rights. Mm -hmm. The Bill of Rights, European Convention, United Nations Declaration, the Magna Carta. Mm -hmm. So many in history have sought to provide a manifesto or a treatise or a syllabus related to rights. Mm -hmm. But with those, say you take the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Is there a section about the rights of your stomach? No. No. Is there a section no. about the rights of your private parts? No. Mm. May relate Something somewhere related, in yeah. terms of honoring, protecting, guarding. Yes. yes. Not disrespecting. Mm -hmm. In all those declarations of rights, is there anything about rights of parents? Mm -hmm. Not really. What's unique is, I ask you, all of these, do they talk about the right of yourself as a human being, your nafs? Mm -hmm. All of these declarations and conventions and bill of rights, do they talk about the self of the human being? Or are we just purely physical? With this treaties, you've got guidance for the physical and guidance for the spiritual. spiritual. Your spiritual growth and your physical growth are both discussed within this treatise. Mm -hmm. And that's what's unique about it in contrast, for example, to the United Nations Declaration or a Bill of Rights or the Magna Carta, that you don't have responsibilities that help actualize your spiritual and physical potential. Yes, these declarations... <clears throat> excuse me, have been fundamental in the growth mm -hmm. of many societies, many countries, many cities. But what's unique about Rasalat al huquq is that the Imam takes you to the very essence of the life of the human being. Yep. Ascent. So let's go into uh, the, the Rasalat al huquq the first treaty of rights. Um, it is that... The first right is God, that we worship Him and we do not associate partners with Him, and it's the belief in God. Okay. Now we do this continuously throughout the whole year and in our homes and at the mosque. But also there is some sort of a campaign <coughs> of atheism, a movement of, of such. Uh, and you know that certain you know, um, young, younger generations will feel a little bit challenged maybe. Maybe they haven't studied Aqaid much. <coughs> Maybe they feel a bit um, intimidated or easily influenced by answers of the Westerners uh, in regards to that there is no such thing as God, that it doesn't exist at all. Now, what do you think about that? And especially in our homes, this new um, breed of, of um, I wouldn't say rebelliousness, but let's say curiosity, <laughs> this new breed of curiosity in our own homes to do with atheism. Well... I think that's the reason that the Imam begins with the right of God. <clears throat> if you look within Risalat al huquq the first is the right of God. And yes, and yes there's no doubt there is, um, there is a movement in the world today to ensure that atheism has a very strong position. But that's not something new as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you've always had periods in our history where atheism was extremely strong, was extremely uh, dominant, there were times where people completely rejected the belief in God. And I really don't have a problem with a human being who sincerely is looking for what is the meaning of life and what is the origin of life. We mm -hmm. all as human beings have metaphysical questions, Indeed. cosmological questions, ethical questions and psychological questions. When there is somebody out there who is an atheist... That person may not be observing the right of God. But that person at the end of the day is someone who may be looking for the truth. Maybe sometimes the reason that person doesn't believe in God is because of the fact that the ones who do believe in God are hypocritical. Mm -hmm. If I now, for example, am a child who was at the church, five years old, four years old, and I was physically abused 
by the head of the church yes. or by the head of the mosque or by the head of the synagogue. I'm going to hate religion. And what's Indeed. at the forefront of religion? God and my responsibilities and duties to God. Yes. So that person who has decided atheism is their way, that person hates the notion of God and the rights of God and one's responsibilities towards God because of the fact that he has seen or she has seen the hypocrites who represent God. Yes. Then there are others who do not believe in God. And the reason they don't believe in God is science. Mm -hmm. Scientifically, I think you could go either way when it comes to reaching a conclusion about God. Yes. I think if you look in the world of science, for every believer who tries to use science to prove God, there is enough atheists in the world who can show through science that there is no God. Mm -hmm. I think both the scientific world who are trying to prove God or trying to disprove God have got valid arguments. Yes. A science, of course, is always open to rethinking, re-experimentation, new theories, what could be postulated today as a conclusion in 10 years' time may be mm -hmm. overruled because of a new finding. Yes, yes. But today in our communities, if I find somebody who's not observing the rights of God, mm -hmm. repeat for me the rights of God again. The first right of God that we worship Him and do not associate partners. To him. Okay. The first right of God, according to Imam Zainal Abidin, that every human being must observe is that we worship Him and we don't associate mm -hmm. partners. That person who isn't worshipping God, who doesn't even believe in God, it's not our duty to kick them out mm -hmm. or to not talk to them yes. or to not open discussion with them. If they are truthfully seeking an answer or they are truthfully and sincerely seeking to understand why we believe in God, then such a person in some cases may be more of a Muslim yes. than the Muslims who surround him. Because we have many Muslims out there. Mm -hmm. They believe in God. But when they believe in God, it's not through understanding. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you ask them to name, for example, two of the 99 names of God, they yes. wouldn't be able to. If you ask them to prove to you God through different arguments, yes. they won't be able to. Mm -hmm. Rather, they believe in Allah because their parents believe in Allah and others <laughs> believe in Allah in their generations. So it's like culturally inherited. <clears throat> culturally inherited. So that person who actively, sincerely is searching for God, if you notice, Sayyid Muhsin, in the usul al deen of a Muslim, mm -hmm. Tawheed, monotheism, is a fundamental component in the pillars of the religion of Islam. Yes. When I believe in God's oneness in Islam, can I believe in it because my parents believe in it? Or is it that I have to rationally and through the world of tradition reach a conclusion that there is a God? Ascent. Even the very statement a person makes when they become a Muslim mm -hmm. highlights that there has to be a lot of reflection before they actually come to the belief in God. Because what do we say when we see someone take his shahada? What's the first few words you say? La ilaha illallah. illallah, for example. Mm -hmm. There is no God but, but Allah. Allah. Well, look at the beginning of it. There is no God. No God. Negation. But Allah, meaning that I've looked around at every definition of God, of gods. Mm -hmm. There is no God. That's but right. Allah. Mm -hmm. Me as a Muslim, I don't just straight away say, I believe in Allah. No. Ashhadu an la ilaha. ilaha. I swear there is no God. Yes. Illa Allah. Except Allah. Therefore, as a Muslim, when I look at someone out there who doesn't believe in Allah and I say, look, you're not observing the first right of mm -hmm. Rasalat al-Hukuq, the rights of God. No. Yes. I should rather, in a way of discussion and dialogue, talk with this person who doesn't believe in God. Look at their arguments. Provide my arguments. At the end yes. of the day, la ikraha fid deen. Exactly. Yes. Whoever wants to believe, let them believe. believe. And whoever wants to disbelieve, let them disbelieve. disbelieve. So if there's any viewers out there that are watching and are looking for God, maybe, or have a friend or a colleague that is looking for God, any advice for them where to look, how to search for it, for, for a truth? Well, I think, I think there's, a, there's a number of ways you, you, you can realize that there's a Lord out there. I personally... When I looked at some of the greatest 
saints of God mm -hmm. and looked at their lives, looked at their moments of humility, their moments of forgiveness. The moment they told me there was a God, that was enough for me. Because if believing in their God made yes. them such wonderful human beings, then I've got nothing to lose believing <laughs> in their God. Yes. <clears throat> I look, for example, at Imam, Imam Ali alayhi salam and look at the fact and look at the moment that he was struck when he was killed. Mm -hmm. His behavior that moment was so impeccable. I want to know the Lord that he's worshipping. Exactly. Because if worshipping the Ascent. Lord Ascent. produces that type of human, mm -hmm. I want his Allah. Yes. I want his God. I don't care if his God is called Krishna, Buddha, Allah. Mm -hmm. I want the Lord that he was worshipping. Yes. Because I've got nothing to lose when I'm worshipping that God. Mm -hmm. What's Pascal's wager about? Yes. You know Pascal's wager. Yes, it's to do with... Um, that if we were to follow religion, what have we ultimately lost at the end? And if we weren't to follow religion, uh, what have we gained at the yeah. end? At the end of the day, my belief in God. Say someone tells me, there's no God, you're messing up, you're, yes. you know, this is not on the path of truth. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, I turn around and say, hold on. I take this belief, I've got nothing to lose. Exactly. Turns out not to be a God. Mm -hmm. I lived as a good human being these yeah. years. And if there is a God, you're the one who loses out in the hereafter. Exactly. But for me, like I said personally, there are some who will look at prophets and saints who told them about God mm -hmm. and say, well, if I can live in a godly manner like they did, mm -hmm. then I've got nothing to lose. There are others who reflect on the creation that surrounds us and say that this could not have come by accident. Ascent. There must be a designer to all of this. Yes. There are others who philosophically say something could come, could not come out of nothing. Yes. There must be a first cause. Uh, cause and effect. Yeah. There are others who may say, put science aside, put famous prophets aside, put famous imams aside. When I'm in trouble, <laughs> yes, there's a the feeling classic, that comes in my head. The classic. Oh, God help me. Hope. Even yeah. the person who doesn't believe, has that feeling, God, yeah. I beg you help me now yes. if you're there. Yes. Even as if that's part of my primordial nature. Yes. When Imam Zain al-Abideen says the first right of God, mm -hmm. the first right in Rasat al is the right of God. Yes. It's the Imam making it clear to all of us that part of your primordial nature mm -hmm. was a recognition of, a supreme, of something yeah. more divine out there. Yes. Something greater than you, something more mm -hmm. noble than you. And so that's another method in which one may find God. But it's a journey. And if I find someone out there who comes to me and says, well, you know, this person in, in your community doesn't believe in God. Mm -hmm. I'll turn around and say, listen, you're on a journey. Yes. I hope in one of these ways <laughs> you'll appreciate God and then yeah, you'll exactly. begin to reflect yes. on the rights of God. Ascent. Discussing the rights of God and the first right was that God should be worshipped. Yeah. Do you feel that the Muslim community rather worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of fear of punishment and fear of hell? I think many of us worshipped God <laughs> out of fear of hell and punishment. You can't deny it. I think mm -hmm. first we worship God out of fear of our mom's slippers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, are some, there are some who worship God because you know you're getting a licking <laughs> if you're not reading your prayer yeah. or you're not fasting in Ramadan or you're not doing this or you're not doing yeah. that. So at the beginning, I would say that a lot of us, our worship of God was more out of fear of Mm -hmm. And ultimately the fear of hell. Yes. But as I said, that's at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, describes this in the most wonderful way. He says, Oh God, I do not worship you out of fear of hell. Mm -hmm. For that's the worship of a slave. slave yes. Nor do I worship you because I want heaven. Mm -hmm. That's the worship of a businessman. businessman. Yes, I worship you rather because I found you worthy of being worshipped. That's the worship of a free Please. human Ascent. being. Ascent. Those three lines summarize the essence and meaning and philosophy of ibadah, mm -hmm. of worship. When Imam Zain al says the first right of God mm -hmm. is that you worship him. him. My lowest level of worship and it's not one to be underestimated. Mm -hmm. It's not 
something negative, but it's a start. Yes. My lowest level of worship highlights my lowest level of understanding. And that is God punishes those who have been unjust, who have been yes. oppressive. Okay, I'm going to pray because I'm scared of hell. Mm. Imam Ali Nabi Talib says, I don't worship you out of fear of hell, mm. for that's the worship of a slave. Okay. Yes. The second level of some of our worship, what mm -hmm. does he say? Nor do I worship you because I want heaven. heaven. That's the worship of a businessman. businessman. I guarantee you that there are a lot of people out there who think that their duty to Allah is to worship him. Why? Because if I worship Allah, Allah will give me heaven. Mm -hmm. How many times do you hear about these uh, suicide bombers? The 72 virgins, yeah. 72 <laughs> virgins. And that if I worship God... God's gonna, you know, uh, I'm gonna have breakfast with the Holy Prophet, peace be yes. uh, upon him, his family, and God's gonna give me rivers, and he's gonna give me lakes, and he's gonna, and he's gonna, and he's gonna, and he's gonna. Their relationship, when it came to worship, they had mm -hmm. missed the meaning of worshiping Allah as our responsibility mm -hmm. to Allah, and Allah's right over us. I don't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I want heaven. Yes. Because that's the worship of a businessman. Mm -hmm. You've seen there are certain people, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. yours. You yes. do me a favor, I'll do you a favor. Mm -hmm. Some people, you'll only attend their house because in the same way that you've gone to their residence, they hope they come back to yours. Mm -hmm. Some will only invite you to a gathering because they'll think that one day you'll invite them to a gathering. gathering. Some of us will only build relationships in the community with those who suit our financial benefit. benefit. Mm -hmm. That second type of worship, where I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I want heaven. Yeah. Again, I'm not observing the haqq of Allah and that is the first in Rasalat al-Huquq. True worship. Mm -hmm. The highest level of worship. Mm -hmm. I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I found Allah worthy of being Allah. worshipped. What do we mean when we say that we found God worthy of being worshipped? Mm -hmm. Why do you think we wake up for Fajr? Honestly. Yes. You think I enjoy waking up for Fajr? Honestly. <laughs> I hope so. But it's, let's, I, be, let's be realistic. I'm, I'm going to be realistic. <laughs> yeah. And it's maybe difficult. there are people out there, probably it's, there's it's many difficult. people out there who are more religious than me. I don't necessarily enjoy waking up for Fajr. Mm -hmm. It's minus 10 in London at, yeah, the, at the moment. moment yeah, it is. Minus 10. No hot water. Neither. I asked the cameraman, <laughs> you enjoy waking up for Fajr? It was snowing yesterday as well, wasn't it? <laughs> it's too cold. There are some who say, listen, Sayyidina, it's not about it being too cold. Mm -hmm. It's I'm going to lose my sleep. Honestly, we had a yeah. friend of ours. Wow. In the community, we had a friend of ours. Honestly, he would say, I don't wake up for Fajr because it's going to ruin the rest of my day. <laughs> because he says I can't go back to sleep. Therefore, I don't wake up for Fajr because of that Masha reason. Mashallah. Mashallah. We pray for that, brother or sister. One level of waking up for Fajr was what? If I don't wake up for Fajr, I'm going to burn in hell. Okay, I'll mm -hmm. wake up. Yeah. A second level of waking up for Fajr is what? If I wake up for Fajr, yeah. God's going to give me the biggest house in Jannah. Yeah, I'll wake up. <laughs> Third level is an essential level in ibadah, which is what? Gratitude. Ascent. How can I claim to love you when I can't wake up in the middle of the night to thank you? Ascent. True? True. How can I claim to love God mm -hmm. and be grateful to God? And the beauty when a person observes the haqq of Allah. The beauty of it is that it builds gratitude in you as a human. Awesome. And I tell you something, most humans are ungrateful. True. Believe you me, Definitely. most human beings, you do them a favor, they forget the favor. Yeah. You look after them, they forget it. You started a business for them, they forget it. Mm -hmm. You help them when you're, they were in trouble, you forget it. You connect them with somebody, they forget it. The human being, insan, what is insan? Insan comes from the word nisyan. Mm -hmm. When we say someone yinsa, what does it mean? They forget. Yeah. <laughs> human beings are forgetful. Yes. You do a human being a favor. Their gratitude in some cases is forgotten after six months. Many of us lack gratitude. Mm -hmm. Imam al-Sadiq, 
alayhi salam many times would say mm -hmm. that the signs of the believers is their gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is worship? Worship is not a, a set of oscillating tongue movements, nor is worship the movement of one's body parts. Anyone mm -hmm. can move their tongue. Anyone can move their body parts. Mm -hmm. Worship is when a person is grateful to God. Thank you for the day I just had. Thank you for the food that's on my table. There are kids in Africa and sometimes, you know, traveling allows the human to grow. I remember my travels in South, in Cape Town, South Africa, oh, my yeah. travels to Kampala, Uganda, mm -hmm. my travels to Dar es Salaam, Nairobi, Mombasa, uh, you know, other parts of, of, of Africa, Durban, mm -hmm. Johannesburg, Congo, Mozambique. Oh, have you been to Africa? All yet? of these places that I've been to, mm -hmm. believe you me, I've seen people with wealth. Yes. And I've also seen those who break their fast or in Muharram just about have food. Wow. When I therefore put my head down in prostration, mm -hmm. I'm observing the haqq of Allah, but in reality, I'm benefiting myself because I'm allowing myself as a human mm -hmm. to also grow and become more free. Ascent. Because why does Imam Ali say, I found you worthy of being worshipped? Wow. That's the worship of a free human, human being. being. It's because you've recognized that this world is so short. Yes. It's life is so short, it's limited. Mm -hmm. Any second we're going to perish. The most powerful with the mansions, with everything, are going to perish. We're yes, all going to be yes. six feet under the ground. Doesn't matter if you're a king or a pauper. Yeah. But I've been given a lot. And I will worship you, not because there's a heaven or hell, even if there wasn't one. Mm -hmm. For what you've given me that I could see mm -hmm. and that I could hear and that I can see and taste and smell. And I have my parents with me and I have a house and shelter mm -hmm. in this freezing weather. In this freezing weather, how many people out there do not appreciate that there are homeless people on the streets True. who are shivering mm -hmm. in a cardboard box? Worship, ibadah, of Allah builds gratefulness in the human. Mm -hmm. Even the ability to say thank you, I can't thank Allah for because he gave me the, the ability to, to say, say thank, thank you. you. Ascent. <clears throat> True? Ascent. That's deep that is. Even the ability when I say shukr, I'm like, you yeah. see, I do shukr. Yeah. Even that ability to say shukr is a blessing from God. Someone asked the question, how do I ensure these blessings don't leave me? Good always question. say alhamdulillah, always mm. say shukr mm. alhamdulillah. These blessings will not leave you. Yes, Therefore, when Imam Zain al-Abdin begins and says, the right of Allah is that you worship him mm -hmm. and you do not associate partners with him. Yes. Worship. If it's seen at its low levels, people are just doing it out of fear. Mm -hmm. But the highest level of ibadah, and when a person really has understood Allah's haqq upon them, yes. is when a person worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not because of heaven or because of hell, but because they found Allah worthy of being worshipped. Ascent. Yeah. Ascent, doctor. Carrying on with the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the rights of worship, um, it says here that the greatest right of God against you is that you worship him without associating anything with him. Now the word associating anything with him, is this in relation to shirk? And shirk being what, just associating partners or is there any other forms of shirk? Sure, in Islam, monotheism is the pillar of the religion. Mm -hmm. Therefore, polytheism is seen as the greatest sin. Shirk is normally the word mm -hmm. which is used for discussing polytheism and the first type of polytheism is when you say there are more than or there is more than one god to be worshipped for example some said there's a god of good yes. and a god of evil mm -hmm. and even if you said there is god a and god b if god b made a decision people will say why did why was god a quiet on that decision yes if god b made a decision people will say god a did he know about that decision yes if god b made a decision people will say god b is more powerful than god a mm -hmm. There will be fasad, as the Quran says, if there were more gods than the one. one. Secondly, when we say there is only one God, we do not mean one in number. Yes. 
Part of recognizing the haqq of Allah is not to put Allah when we say Allah is one. Qul huwa Allahu ahad does not mean ahad. And then you have one, two, three, four, five. So you mean like in, as in a sequence? He's not you one You cannot in say sequence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one because the number one is divisible. Oh, okay. The number one can be multiplied. Yes. The number one can be, for example, <coughs> doubled. Mm -hmm. Therefore, putting partners to Allah is the main form of polytheism that is denounced in Islam. However, can someone believe in Allah but still yes. be a mushrik? As in, can yes. someone believe in one God mm -hmm. but still be a polytheist? Yes. yes. Wow. For example, I believe in one God, but mm -hmm. I've made idols to represent that God. Okay. The Arabs, in the time of the Holy Prophet, mm -hmm. peace be upon him, his family, the Arabs used to believe in one God. Okay. One God. But they used to have idols okay. who were representing a different attribute of that one God. Okay. So some of the Arabs used to say, that's the God of love. Asan. That's the idol of love. That's the idol of destiny. MashaAllah. Hubal, Lat, Uzza, Manat. How many idols were there in the Kaaba? Th over 300. I think one for every day, probably. <laughs> one for every day of the year. <laughs> but if you ask the Arabs, these are gods, they said, no, these take us nearer to God. Okay. That's shirk. Uh -huh. Even if a religion today says that we believe in one God, if your Imam tells us that we must worship one God mm -hmm. because it's the haq of that God to be worshipped, we will worship that one God. Say, so yes, but you cannot put God in the form of an image. Why? Because then mm -hmm. you're able to define God. And uh -huh. if you're able to define God, you've limited yes. God. Yes. And that which is limited philosophically uh -huh. should not be worshipped. Number three, can I believe in Allah and still be a mushrik mm -hmm. and not give Allah his haqq? Yes, I'll give you an example. When I'm praying salah, <clears throat> Mawlana has come home. Mm -hmm. Normally my salah, I pray it. Very fast. <laughs> when Mawlana's home, suddenly the salah becomes a bit slower. <laughs> My dua, I used to only say, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. Now Mawlana's come home. Rabbi ghfir li wa li walidaya wa arhamuma. Ya Allah, ya Rahman, ya Rahim, ya Muqallib al-Qulum. Allahumma kulli waliyika. In my sujood, before I say, Subhanahu wa ya Latif, Arham, 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 up. Now it's Ya Latif, Arham, Abdika, Allah. Ya Wali Al Afi, Nasaluk Al Afi. Allahumma, Ya Salka, Raha, and the Mot, while Makhira Tabad al Mot. Allahumma, Zukna Shafat al Hussein. For example, that shirk, it's a minor form of shirk. I see. So you have the major form and the minor form. Are both haram? Both of them are seen as prohibited in Islam. Okay. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. In salah we say every day. In our tashahud. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له. مولانا can never come near Allah when I'm worshiping Allah. Because you know some people, for example, when it comes to their salah, because Mawlana is watching, they start to pray it in a different way or quietly. No. Now you've put a partner to Allah and who you're trying to please okay. in ibadah. There you have not observed the haqq of Allah. Asan. Therefore shirk, the major form of it was those who were worshipping more than one God. Mm -hmm. But the minor form can also affect even the Muslims within the world. Asan. Asan, doctor. Dearest viewers, we're going for a short break now. But inshallah, join us after the break as we continue this, the discussion on the rights of God with Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. And if you have any questions that you'd like to direct towards the doctor, please call on 0203-515-0199 or alternatively, you could uh, text us on WhatsApp with the number provided. See you after the break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Live in London as we were discussing the rights of God. Doctor, we were discussing uh, shirk and uh, I do believe sometimes the Shia are always um, you know, labelled uh, 
uh, as as you know doing shirk and stuff like that have we have the shia and the muslim community have we really honored the rights of uh, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that imam sajjad has been uh, yeah. discussing here Yes, I constantly have seen people who have accused, you know, the Shia of being mushrik. Mm -hmm. And so there are people who will say that if you're trying to observe the first right in Risalat al-Huquq, yes. and that is that you don't associate partners to Allah, then how comes the Shia, for example, associate Muhammad and Ali and Fatima and Hassan mm -hmm. and Hussein with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? First and foremost... If you read all of the traditions of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt not only do they denounce those who dare to call them divine mm -hmm. yes. in the sense of equal partners to Allah, okay. but always their source of pride is being mentioned as being of those who obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. So even if you look at the ziyara of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam for example, mm -hmm. We always say, "Ashhadu anna ka qad aqamta al-salat, wa atayta al-zakat, wa amarta bil-ma'roof, wa nahayta 'an al-munkar, wa ta'ta Allah wa Rasulahu hatta ataka al-yaqin." We always make it clear that the Imam himself <coughs> has obeyed Allah and His Prophet throughout his life. When we, for example, maybe in some of the supplications, say. اللهم إني أسألك وأتوجه إليك بنبيك. The question is directed to Allah. Yes. Through the intermediary that is one of those who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has blessed. I can ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala directly. I'm not saying أهل البيت عليهم السلام can help me independent of Allah. They can help me dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 5 verse 35, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu Allah wa abtaghu ilayhi al-wasila. O you who believe, be conscious of Allah and seek a wasila, seek a means to reach Allah. I'm seeking a means to reach Allah. My prayers, my supplications, my fasts, all of these are means in which I'm seeking to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the means that I'm using are those who were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. Yes. There are those who Allah has given the ability to intercede in Ayatul Kursi. Yes. We read the line, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ None can intercede on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except with His permission. With permission. Those who come and say the Shia put Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, Hussein mm -hmm. alongside Allah. This is nonsense. No mm -hmm. way. These are servants of Allah, creations of Allah. But the greatest of the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, when I recite a dua, someone asked the Holy Prophet, why is my dua not being accepted? He said to him, do you recite salawat mm -hmm. on Muhammad and Al-Muhammad before you begin a dua? <laughs> Person said to him, why? He said, because reciting salawat on Muhammad and al-Muhammad before reciting a dua removes the veils Hassan. for that dua to be accepted. Mm -hmm. We even have traditions that Adam asked, Ya Allah, in the name of Muhammad, wa antal Mahmud. In the name of Ali, wa antal A'la. In the name of Fatima, wa anta Fatima al-Samawat wal In the name of Al-Hasan, wa antal Muhsin. In the name of Al-Husayn, wa anta Qadim al hasan Oh Allah, please mm -hmm. forgive me for what I've done. Mm -hmm. Therefore, those who come and say that you Shia are Mushrik, they might also argue, but Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Imam Ali, mm -hmm. Sayyidah Fatima, Imam Al-Hassan, Imam Hussain, have all died now. Why are yes. you asking the dead? dead? Okay. You ask them when they're alive, we can understand yes. that they have a special position. Hassan and Hussain are Sayyidah Shabab Ahlul Jannah. Yes. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam is the door to the city of knowledge yes. amongst his million other um, attributes. attributes that have been given to him. Fatima, whoever is a part of me. Fatima mm -hmm. is a part of me. Whoever angers, angers me. me. And whoever angers me, angers yeah, Allah. Allah. They say, okay, but they're all dead now. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when you're now saying, Ya Muhammad, Ya Ali, Ya Fatima, Ya Hassan, Ya Hussein, okay. they're saying, you're not observing the right 
-hmm. of Allah in Risalat al Hukuk. Repeat to me the right again. The greatest right of God against you is that you worship Him without associating anything with Him. Is that you worship Him without associating. So they're saying when you are now asking Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa alihi, in Medina or Ali in Najaf or Fatima buried in Medina or Imam mm -hmm. al-Hassan buried in Medina or Imam al Hussein buried in Karbala. Mm -hmm. When you're asking them, you're doing shirk because you're putting them at the same level as Allah yes. subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we said clearly, yes. firstly, these are creations of Allah, servants yes. of Allah. They are the ones mm -hmm. who taught us how to worship Allah subhanahu yes. wa ta'ala. They are the ones who were known for having the longest of sujoods, yes. which indicate to all those around them that in mm. their longest prostrations, they were all creations of Allah. But secondly, those who say they have died, why are you asking? I reply mm. by saying this. The Quran told me, yes. not everybody who has died is dead. Is mm. dead. Rather, there are some who are still alive. Yes. Ask any Muslim, what's the verse, main verse you'd use for a martyr, for a shaheed? Mm -hmm. How many times you hear in our lectures? Do not count those who have died in the way of Allah as being dead. Rather, they are alive. We know the martyr can intercede on the day of judgment. Do you agree? I agree. We know that the person who dies as a shaheed, they are not dead, rather, they are alive. Not just alive. <coughs> <clears throat> if someone says to me they are alive, yes. the ayah continues by saying, mm -hmm. They are receiving rizq from Allah. Yes. Tell me, Rasulullah died in which year? <sighs> 11 after Hijrah. Yeah. Fatwa Zahra alayhi salam died in which year? Six 11 after, after Hijrah. Imam Amir al Mu'minin died in which year? 40 yeah. after Hijrah. Imam al Hassan died in which year? 50 after Hijrah. Yeah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam died in which year? 61 after Hijrah. They all died mm -hmm. physically. In Islam, is that the end? Or do they go to another part <laughs> of the journey? That's the beginning, like you said yeah. beautifully. That's another. Now it's the beginning of the journey. From yes. when you die, mm -hmm. say we don't discuss, for example, the grave and so on. Yes. You go towards the world of Barzakh. Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتَ بَلْ أَحْيَا Do not count those who have died mm. in the way of Allah as being dead, rather they are alive. alive. Receiving rizq, subhanallah. Sustenance. Today, if I receive rizq, I'm living over here for example. Mm -hmm. Say I receive rizq while I'm here. What's the rizq? You bring me some fruits. You bring me some food. You bring me some tea. Mm -hmm. You put money in my account. Mm -hmm. I have parents. I can help you if you ask me for something. That's a form of rizq. Yes. Your health. But when someone dies, mm -hmm. how are they still receiving rizq? And what is the rizq that they're receiving? Asant. What is this rizq that someone who's died, the yes. Quran says, don't count those who have died in the way of Allah as being dead. Yes. Rather they are alive, receiving the rizq, rizq from Allah Allah. subhanahu wa ta'ala. Asant. They might be able to help us. Mm -hmm. Allah might give them a certain amount of time to come back and see us. Maybe on a Thursday night, every once in a while, those who have died can come back to their families. Mm -hmm. In other words, when I'm saying I have something I want to ask, and someone says, You Shia or Mushrik, you ask Muhammad and Ali. No, I, I ask Allah, Ya Allah, Bihaqi Muhammad. Wa anta al Mahmud. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Because my Prophet is the greatest to have died in the way of his Lord. Yes. And those who have died in the way of their Lord are not dead. Rather, they are alive, receiving rizq Asif from Allah. Allah. Yes. Part of that rizq may be that he could tell Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this servant mm -hmm. of yours mention my name in their yeah. dua. And no name is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the name Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Secondly, those who say that you Shia are mushrik and therefore not observing the haqq of Allah that you worship him and you do not put partners to Allah. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are times that us as Shia may perform certain actions that may give the image that these people are committing shirk. Let me give you an example. When someone goes to Karbala, mm -hmm. there might be a few people who do sujood 
towards the grave of Imam al-Hussein alayhi yes. salam. Someone goes to Najaf, you're walking in, someone, you might see someone who the emotion has overtaken them. Mm -hmm. And they might be at that moment doing sujood towards the grave of Imam Ali. Now, I know very well as a Muslim, I have to make 70 excuses for any Muslim when I see any act. Yes. Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah lengthen his Isn't life, it? has made it clear. Anybody who is doing sujood towards the grave of the Imam, mm -hmm. if their intention is to thank Allah mm -hmm. for helping them mm -hmm. come towards the visitation of the Imam and thank Allah for giving them a blessing in their life like that Imam, yes. there's no harm. Mm -hmm. But if your sujood is towards that grave, to, to that mm -hmm. Imam, that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. Now, if now someone shows me on the internet, they say, look at these Shia, they're doing sujood towards the... Yes. Listen, when you do sujood towards the Kaaba in Mecca, yes. you're sitting in Masjid al-Haram doing sujood. Yeah. There are prophets buried around the Kaaba. I could easily turn around and say, you're worshipping Nabi Ismail. You'll say, no, 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 I'm not worshipping Nabi Ismail, I'm worshipping Allah. Yes, but Nabi Ismail is buried right there. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not going to give you benefit of the doubt, I'm going to say, you're worshipping Nabi Ismail because Nabi Ismail is buried right next to the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. I could turn around to other Muslims and say that they are mushrik because they do sujood towards Hajar Ismail yes. where there are prophets of Allah buried, buried there. there. Yes. So therefore they are mushrik. No, I give benefit of that. Likewise, when you see someone who does that sujood, don't straight away say, oh, they are doing sujood to Ali. They do sujood to Allah, thanking Allah mm -hmm. for allowing them to complete that ziyarah. Mm -hmm. Number three, when you say to me that I as a Shia am a mushrik, mm -hmm. I'm the one who believes Allah has hands or you. <laughs> I'm the one who believes Allah has a shin or you. I'm the one who believes Allah has eyes or you. I'm the one who believes that Allah sits on a throne or you. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who believes that Allah sticks his feet in mm -hmm. hellfire or you. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed that in the last 35, 40 years, how many books have been published saying Shia are mushriks? Shia believe in a different Qur'an and we don't want to bring books such as Suyuti's Itqan to the frame mm -hmm. and show what others have traditions in their works. So that will leave for another day. Shia are mushriks mm -hmm. because they believe in this and that. Uh, you tell me that your Allah mm -hmm. has hands, has eyes, mm -hmm. sits on a arsh, mm -hmm. sorry, sits on a throne, has a shin, sorry, has a feet, sticks his feet in the fire of hell. I could easily turn around and say, hold on. What you are saying is shirk. How could you put body parts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Exactly. Shirk is not just putting partners to Allah. Mm -hmm. Some may have become mushriks by associating a daughter to Allah, a son to Allah. Mm -hmm. Some may have become mushriks by praying to Allah, but trying to impress others instead of Allah. Yes. But some also became mushrik. Because of the fact that they believe that Allah, who cannot be defined, mm -hmm. eyes cannot perceive, لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدركه الأبصار. They say, well, yeah, you can't see him in this world, but you'll see him in the hereafter. But even he tells Moses, لن تراني. You'll never, ever, 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 ever see me. Do I turn around to those Muslims who sit there today and say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is someone who has a hand and eyes. And mm -hmm. when they looked at the Ayatul Kursi, they said he sits on a Kursi. Do I look at all of them and say that these are all mushriks? Not at all. Mm -hmm. I say when a Muslim says to me, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, I take it that this person is a believer mm -hmm. in monotheism and has observed the haqq of Allah as it's meant to be. So, said Muhsin, like you said, there are those who say the Shia are mushrik, they are not observing the haqq of Allah. On the contrary, all of these can be refuted. Awesome. Yeah. Just a quick reminder to the viewers that if you do have a question for Sayyid Amar, please contact us on 0203 515 or alternatively you can contact the WhatsApp, the number should be there at the bottom and you can direct your question to the doctor. Sayyid, if we continue reading the, great, the greatest rights of Allah, of the greatest rights of God, uh, we, we discussed about that the right of God against you is that you worship Him and you don't associate any uh, partners with Him. Uh, when you do that with sincerity, ikhlas, now, what does the Imam Sajjad, what is he talking about here? 
sincerity and and i mean how can we um introduce this or maintain or improve this in our salah however many people you'll try and please in this world Mm -hmm. One way or the other They'll all let you down <laughs> Yes Therefore focus all of your passion All your energy All your love To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> There are those Who think that they're observing The haqq of Allah With a very good action Which lacks sincerity <laughs> What do I mean? There's a, a funny story they say that there was a mosque built mm -hmm. and there were three main donors. Okay. Ibrahim, Musa, and Tariq. Okay. These were the three biggest donors. One gave a million dollars, second gave two million dollars, a third gave five million dollars. MashaAllah. Ibrahim and Musa used to come to the mosque 24 7. Tariq mm -hmm. never comes. Okay. But Tariq loves his name being at the front. <laughs> <laughs> so when this mosque was being built Tariq was like You know what I've done a lot of haram this year And there's a lot of wealthy people Who love giving charity Because it looks after the sins They've done in the year Okay Not, not because you know what Charity <laughs> for that cause No 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 Where can I give Orphans I'll give orphans Because I've had a couple of glasses Too many this year Done a bit <laughs> of haram here Gambled a bit of money here Stolen from here uh, Is there any or, yeah, I give to the orphans MashaAllah give me the, Show me the orphans your niyyah is what? Is it full of sincerity? Because in Islam, an act is incomplete if there is no ikhlas. Ascent. And the purest ikhlas is your act solely for Allah SWT. And that's why Surah Al-Tawheed is also called mm -hmm. Surah Al-Ikhlas. Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid, wa lam yulad, wa lam yakul lahu kufu wa nahad. That you give your whole sincerity in your act to Allah. So, Ibrahim, million dollars. Musa, two million dollars. Tariq, five million dollars. Tariq, it was the day of the opening of the mosque. Tariq's come. Now, Tariq doesn't read any Quran, has no <laughs> interest in the mosque. He gets Mawlana to read Quran for him. MashaAllah. But you know what? When it comes to the mosque donation, if it's going to give me a big name, people are going to say, you know what? This guy donated to the mosque. Mm -hmm. So be it. So I'll give the biggest donation. Mawlana came, saw Ibrahim. Salamu alaikum, Ibrahim. How are you? So Musa, Musa, salamu alaikum, how are you? So Tariq, Tariq, salamu alaikum, how are you? Thank you all for your donation. Shall we begin with salah? Yes, Mawlana, begin. Mawlana began with the salah. In the second surah after surah al-Fatiha, he recited the surah, <coughs> excuse me, which has the ayah, Suhuf mm -hmm. Ibrahim and Musa. The scrolls of Abraham and Moses. Which ayah? Suhufi Ibrahim wa Musa. What was the name of the first two donors? Ibrahim and Musa. What's the name of the third donor? Tariq. He is baffled. <laughs> Why is Mawlana mentioning <laughs> them in Salah, not me? Suhufi Ibrahim, Musa is not these two. Who is it referring to? Yes. Nabi Ibrahim and Nabi? Nabi Musa. But because the guy doesn't come to the mosque at all, mm -hmm. no interest in religion, even the donation is only done to try and show off to the people, lacking sincerity, he heard the Mawlana recite the ayah, mm -hmm. he came later on to the Mawlana. Mawlana, salamu alaykum. He said, Mawlana, you know me. He said, of course, Tariq. How could I not know you give the nicest donation? <laughs> he said, then Mawlana, but you forgot me. He said, where? He said, Mawlana, you forgot me just now. He said, where? He said, in Salah, you mentioned the other two donors, you never mentioned me. <laughs> he said to him, Habibi Tariq, those are Nabi Musa and Nabi Ibrahim, not Ibrahim and Musa. And if you want, we'll read the Surah, wa sama wa Tariq, for example. <laughs> Sometimes a person thinks that they have observed the right of God by performing an act. But if that act lacks ikhlas, mm -hmm. then you have not truly observed the rights of God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want us to give charity without sincerity. Indeed. Doesn't want us to perform any acts, not because these acts benefit him. For us, sincerity humbles us. Ascent. When you're giving something sincerely, it's different. Mm -hmm. There are some who think that the prayer being recited in a nice voice is enough. 
you're reciting it in that nice voice. In your salah, are you thinking, look how beautiful my voice is? Mm -hmm. Or are you thinking this is the most beautiful way to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Therefore, ikhlas became a fundamental factor in observing the haqq of Allah. That al-amal al-salih, not just the amal, mm -hmm. doing a deed, for it to be righteous, one of the key components is sincerity. Oh, yeah. So when we talk about in sin sincerity, and then we also we can link it towards intention. Um, how important is intention uh, viewed in Islam, and how does it link to the sincerity as well? Well, definitely in Islam we have the famous tradition, which is oft narrated, "Inna al amal bin niyat." Yes. Indeed. Your actions are judged by your intentions. The basis of them is what? The intention. Your intention. Before salah, many of us will say, Usalli salat al dhuhr I pray dhuhr salah, qurbatan ila Allah. So I may get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why would I say these lines? Mm -hmm. Because I want to make it clear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that my intention in this salah, not to please mom and dad, mm -hmm. my intention in this salah, not to show off to my friends. Mm -hmm. So I may get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before every act in the religion of Islam, a person recites a niyyah. Some think that the niyyah has to be said loudly. No, what's in the heart is fundamental. And no one is closer to your heart than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows what's in your heart before you perform any act. There was that one person was praying in the mosque one day. Praying fast, 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 fast. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden heard the door open. Who do you think it was? Maulana. <laughs> it was a, and he's like, the oh God, the Maulana's in. Intention begun mm -hmm. closer to Allah. Ended, how can I get closer to Maulana? Awesome. What did he start doing? Pray slow, slow, slow. Finished, he thought, you know what? Let's see what Maulana thought of my salah. Mm -hmm. Turned around, it was a stray animal walking into the mosque. <laughs> but that animal has strayed into the mosque. Yes. And because that animal had strayed into the mosque, that person had thought that was the Mawlana. Look where the intention went. Mm -hmm. Would you believe even in the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, everybody thought that if you went on jihad, mm -hmm. you were observing the right of God, you were worshipping God, you weren't associating partners to God, mm -hmm. and you were also sincere in your actions. Okay. And then the Holy Prophet, even in the act of jihad, said, even amongst us, there are some who have come for jihad today, not mm -hmm. because they want to please Allah. Wow. One of the people had come, they called him what? The martyr of the donkey. <laughs> this guy, <laughs> one of the Arabs in the opposition, take his donkey. <laughs> when they had taken his donkey, he's come to the battle. Everyone's thinking, mashallah, you've come to the battle, you've come to the battle, you've come to the battle. Every single one of you guys has come to the battle. They're praising each other. This guy's like, listen, guys, I ain't come here for no battle. Mm -hmm. That guy's got my donkey. I'm going <laughs> to win back my donkey. What's his near? Oh. Was his near a sincere near to serve God? To protect the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family? To protect the message of the Quran? No. Mm -hmm. And that's why even in religion and the field of religion, Allah knows why you are serving him. Are you lecturing to achieve fame? Mm-hmm. Are you lecturing because it brings power? Mm -hmm. Are you lecturing because you want to look after your family's interests? Are you gaining knowledge to show off knowledge? Mm -hmm. So in Islam, intention affects more than anyone those who claim to be close to God. Yes. That's what's my intention when I appoint someone. Is it that they're the best for the job? Or is it that they're my wife's cousin, sister's brother's daughter's husband? Mm -hmm. When I build a mosque, is it to truly serve the community or to fight another mosque? Mm -hmm. When I build a charity, is it so it becomes a non-profit to look after my kids and grandkids and grandkids and grandkids' yes. future or to truly serve the orphans of that region? Therefore, sincerity and intention go hand in hand with one another when it comes to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doctor, you also mentioned a lot in your lectures and, um, that there's a great reward for such worship uh, with sincerity. 
Now, there's no one more sincere in their worship apart from uh, the Imams and the Prophets. But unfortunately, they, um, when they met their, their destiny, it was either by poison or by the sword. And a lot of them were butchered and killed. I mean, what sort of reward is this for the insincerity? It's the greatest reward. Yes. The greatest reward because it's one thing saying I'm patient. It's another seeing Hussein bin Ali at Karbala. Mm -hmm. Can give lectures all his life on patience. But to see patience in its most perfect form on the 10th of Muharram is something wonderful. And it's a lesson for all. Some will say, okay, if someone is worshipping Allah, not propaganda to Allah, sincerely, why does Allah see them have horrific deaths? Mm -hmm. To me and you, yes, they're horrific. To them, they're hurt by what happens to their family members. But to them, part of their mystical divine worldview is that each of these limbs was a gift from you. What harm is it if they're cut into pieces out of love for you? Mm -hmm. There is a group of lines which are attributed to Imam Hussein alayhi salam. It's an attribution to him. The reliability mm -hmm. is open to question. But I left the world for the sake of you. I orphan my children so I may see you. So if I am cut into pieces for the love of you, my heart would lean to none other than you. Sincerity, worship, associating no one with Allah, all in one piece of wisdom from Imam Al-Hussein. I left this world for the sake of you. Yes. Me and you would have run away from Karbala. Yes. I left this world for the sake of you. Yes. I orphan my children so I may see you. Mm -hmm. If I am cut into pieces... For the love of you, my heart would lean to none other than you. In another line, Imam al Hussein himself says, If bodies are meant to die and decay, mm -hmm. then let my body be cut into a thousand pieces. What does he mean by that? If bodies are meant to die and decay, decay, let my body be. Meaning what? Mm -hmm. What's more eternal, the body or the soul? So, so even if you take my body away, mm -hmm. My soul and the soul of my message remains alive. Mm -hmm. And if this act of mine is an act which pleases Allah, then so be it. There's a line from Imam Zain al-Abidin salam in a Sahih of Sajjadi. You know what he says? Let me live mm -hmm. while my life is in obedience to you. Awesome. Moment it goes into obedience of shaitan, take me away. Mm -hmm. Their whole life was dedicated to their Lord because they truly were grateful yes. and they recognized the meaning of the true essence of worship. Mm -hmm. Humility, gratitude, thankfulness. Yes. When they die, for me and you, it's death. It hurts, mm -hmm. yeah. it's the end, it's scary. For them, it's a return back to their creator because the whole philosophy of inna lillah wa inna mm -hmm. ilayhi mm -hmm. is embodied in their life. Yes. Yeah. Hassan. Uh, doctor, I do believe we have a caller. Uh, Salamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Salamu alaikum. Sorry, we do have some technical difficulties, which is... Uh, <laughs> Every time the first line of the Q&A is technical difficulties. It's been quite common. But inshallah, please call again and inshallah we'll direct you towards the doctor and you can ask your question. Uh, doctor, in regards to uh, the greatest rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, he has made it binding upon himself to give you sufficiency in the affairs of this world and the next. Is this referring back to that Quranic ayah that you were talking about or is, is it a bit more to uh, this that like Imam Sajjad has written here? No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it clear that those who want reward in this world and the hereafter, mm -hmm. the formula is simple. Worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sincerity. Yes. And that is the formula required. Mm -hmm. Nothing more, nothing less. We have complicated Islam. Okay. The Islam that we have today, we've complicated. 
The reality at the beginning of this religion, when it was first revealed, was a religion with a spiritual, moral worldview. Yes. That the human being tries their hardest to ensure that all their acts are acts of sincerity mm -hmm. and that they try their hardest to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the purest of intentions. That was the origin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this one line. But there's something fundamental here as well. That for me to gain this reward in this world and the hereafter, my worship shouldn't tire me. Yes. My worship shouldn't be done at a time when I'm upset. Okay. My worship shouldn't be a worship where I'm feeling lazy okay. because that'll leave a bad feeling on that act of worship. Mm -hmm. Imam Sadiq says, I was doing tawaf. I was doing tawaf of the Kaaba and my father, Imam al Baqir, looked at how much I was praying. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, even little prayer, but with sincerity is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Awesome. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Imam Zayn does not give you 25 lines in the first of the huquq in the risala. Yes. Simple. Mm -hmm. The first right of God is, is that, that you, you worship, worship him. him. You do not associate partners with him. Yes. And you do this with sincerity. Yes. And Allah yes. has made yes. it binding yes. upon yes. himself yes. that he will give you the rewards of this world and the hereafter. hereafter. Yeah. Ascent. So in regards to the sincerity, what if there is someone who is a non-Muslim but sincerely worships a supreme being uh, with sincerity, considering this is, has been such an uh, important element in, in tonight's discussion and with the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what happens to that person in the hereafter? Once again, you know, if there is a non-Muslim who worships God, sincerely worships God, maybe he's a Christian, for example, someone Jewish, for example, mm -hmm. not a Muslim, but they sincerely worship God, the ultimate salvation for them lies in the hands of God. Me and you awesome. cannot decide. Mm -hmm. We don't know what their intentions were behind their actions. Awesome. We don't know their intentions in their private life and in their public life. Mm -hmm. We don't know what was their final belief and we also don't know which Islam reached them. Mm -hmm. Someone might say, well, if the Christian and the Jew heard about the Prophet Muhammad and rejected him, they can never find heaven. But which Prophet Muhammad did they hear about? Mm -hmm. The Prophet Muhammad that ISIS portrays. Okay. Yes. The Prophet Muhammad that certain European Orientalists wanted to portray. Mm -hmm. Like the Muhammad in the bottom of hell in, in, in Dante's Inferno. Mm -hmm. Or the real Prophet Muhammad that's portrayed by Imam al Baqir, Imam al Sadiq, and the Ahlul Bayt. Awesome. There are certain people who worship God sincerely. Those people have observed that right of God, the first of the rights in Rasulullah al -Hukuk. But they may never have heard of Prophet Muhammad. They may never have heard of Islam. Mm -hmm. As long as they've worshipped God sincerely, yes. they've given their all back to their Lord because of gratefulness, not because of peer pressure, not because of, for example, people around them, forcing them through coercion. No, sincerely, they have worshipped God in the best of ways that they could then who are we to say that the bliss of the hereafter will not be rewarded for them? It's sad when we see many Muslims out there who say, heaven is only for the Muslims. Mm -hmm. It's very sad. There are many non-Muslims in the world today who sincerely love God, sincerely worship God, sincerely work on behalf of God, sincerely spread the word of God. And if those people are people who have tried to be people of the purest intentions and build the best of societies and help build the most peaceful coexistence. Where is this show right now, for example? This show right now. Oh, it's no. in Europe. Mm -hmm. You have shows, for example, in America. Yes. You have Majalis in Canada, in Australia. Those are countries where, which are majority non-Muslim. Yes. But they recognize that your path is a path to God. Their path is a path, path to, to God. God. And they've given you a time to have on the television, on the airwaves. Mm -hmm. So for us as Muslims to assume that we are the only ones who can observe the haqq of Allah, mm -hmm. not at all. On the contrary, there are non-Muslims out there who can observe the haqq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm -hmm. and it is not for us to judge where they will be in the hereafter. In the same way, it is not for us to know where we will be until that day. Awesome. I've got one question here on the sure. WhatsApp and it's to do with... Um, Salam brother, a great show as normal. Uh, tell the say that he's done a great job and a big effect in my life. Um, in regards to prayer, 
how can one improve the prayer with sincerity and with um, intention? Well, one of the rights of Rasalat al Hukuk is going to be the right of prayer. Okay. So we'll and as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh -huh. the Rasalat al Hukuk is not like the UN Declaration of Rights. Yes. That's got nothing on, for example, how do I improve my prayer, the, yeah. the, the duty that someone has when yeah. they pray. So one of them is the what is the haq of ibadah or the haq of salah, the haq of praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're going to discuss that where the imam talks about how much responsibility and duty we have when it comes to our prayers, inshallah. A final point, doctor, for the viewers, anything you want them to say? Well, as I said, you discussion? know, inshallah, all of us can, you know, move in this journey together in Rasalat al -Hukuk. This was only the first one. Yes. And I hope that everybody goes online, whether it's in Arabic, whether it's in English, yes. whether it's in other languages, picks up Rasalat al -Hukuk. As we, inshallah, shall see on Friday's show, inshallah. we move from the right of God to the right of the self, self. of the human being yes. and look at the different journeys of the self and how Imam Zain al Abidin talks about them. Asan. To the brothers and sisters and all the dearest viewers, thank you for joining us on tonight's topic. Inshallah, like the Sayyid said, on Friday we'll be discussing the rights of yourself. So please join us on Friday at 9pm here on Imam Hussain TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.